Okay. Hi, everyone. Hi, Ryan. Thanks for coming on on no. Ask the Experts. So this is a show where you get to ask our expert. Today is Ryan Carson, a lawyer, and we're going to get to ask him all our corporate structure questions, which I'm excited about. Thanks for coming on, Ryan. My pleasure. So do you want to just uh, tell people a little bit about yourself to start with, like what type of what kind of help can they get from you? Sure, absolutely. So I've been a lawyer for, I think I'm in my 16th year now, uh, starting in June. And uh, since uh, 2013, I've owned my own firm, which is Carson Law. And in 2017, Carson Law took over. And then in 2019, amalgamated with Chris Breen's practice, which was Breen Law. So we've uh, in the last 15 going on 16 years, we've been working pretty hard at growing and expanding um, our business. I started just myself, by, just my, by myself. Uh, and, and we're at about uh, a team of about 25, give or take, uh, personnel, of which there's about six or seven uh, lawyers and a paralegal. So we're we're excited. We're we're like a lot of people interested in growing and and developing. We're a we're a bit of a younger group, probably compared to most law firms. Um, but with that, uh, youth comes energy and excitement about uh, about what we do. Uh, we work a lot with uh, real estate uh, matters. Uh, a lot of our real estate matters are with investors. Um, so we are working. Uh, quite a bit with uh, real estate investor clients, uh, which is great because it's usually not just, you know, doing a purchase and a sale or a refinance. It's not just the one-off real estate transaction. There's typically other documents and other matters that kind of tie into it, you know, discussions about corporate, uh, doing incorporations, uh, potentially there's agreements, joint ventures, um, and then uh, also there should be discussion with the real estate investor about, you know, estate planning and, and uh, what, have, what have they got in place there. So um, it's a great client for us to work with. Um, but outside of real estate and the real estate investor, we obviously do corporate work. So working with people who are business owners or soon to be business owners on a whole variety of things. Um, we work with commercial. So that's like people buying and selling actual businesses. Um, we work with people on, as I said, estate planning. So that's wills, powers of attorney, uh, family trusts. Uh, we help people with estate administration. So if somebody's passed away, we can provide services to help administer the estate. And I also act as a trustee myself. So actively involved as an executor or power of attorney on a couple client matters right now. And those are all areas that myself and other lawyers work in. And then we do have a separate lawyer in the firm who does litigation work. Um, and she also helps in the paralegal with our, our landlord tenant board and small claim matters. And, uh, and then we also have a, another lawyer that uh, does uh, intellectual property. So that's patents, trademarks, copyrights, e-commerce. So that's at a very high level me, the firm, and the team. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Good to a lot. <laughs> I'm glad so you think so. <laughs> <laughs> so today's topic is corporate structures, like I said. So let's get started with the first question. Let's get just to the basics. So, um, and obviously we're going to be talking about real estate investors specifically for them. Um, what kind of corporate structures are you seeing? you seeing um happening for real estate investors um corporate structures so i mean really we kind of see a whole like bunch of different uh items because um even though there could be like some common items that you could kind of suggest i mean everybody's situation is unique kind of to themselves but to give you an idea of some of the common ones that we see I mean, a lot of people will be familiar with the term like joint venture. So we, we see a lot of people doing joint venture agreements with one another. And so that's a, a common sort of business arrangement or structure that we see real estate investors choosing. Um, we see others doing more of a, a corporate route 
which would be essentially them doing all of their um, business um, relationship with uh, within a corporation. So a corporation is acquiring the property and they're all going to be shareholders in the same corporation. And then so they have a shareholders agreement govern essentially their um, relationship with one another. And then the, the third one, which is kind of becoming a bit of more of a hot topic, I think, because a lot of our real estate investor clients and probably many of your followers and people that are you know, going to watch and, and listen to this at a later date, um, a lot of people are probably now hearing um, you know, the term scaling. And when you're you know, scaling, one of, the, one of the ways you can do that potentially a bit easier um, at least on the on the structure side of it, corporate structure side of it, is through what's called a GPLP structure, which is a general partnership, limited partnership um, arrangement. And so that's becoming quite common for people to want to uh, talk to us about because a lot of our clients um, are, are interested in, in sort of growing and scaling their portfolio kind of outside of some of the smaller uh, projects and or trying to go after um, investor funds that are more at arm's length, more third party, as opposed to through like friends and family and so forth, right? So um, those are the common like three, I'd say structures or arrangements that we see people sort of talking and choosing when it comes to um, doing real estate investment deals. Okay, great. And so out of these three, so let's, yeah, let's dive into these three. What would be the suggestions you would give to, be, sorry, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Sorry. You gave me a face. I thought, I thought I would, you couldn't hear me. <laughs> no, so, no. Yeah. I can. Okay. So, um, so talking about these three that you, that you were telling us, telling us about, what would you say is like maybe some deciding factors that people should take into consideration when going into like deciding which one best suits them? Well, it's, it's a bit of a holistic approach and conversation, um, which we always strongly would recommend the investors like having this conversation with more than just us. Um, we need to have a conversation at the same time with the investor and their, like their finance arrangements. So whether it's through the bank directly or mortgage broker, um, they, they should have some input in, in some of this conversation since they're going to be working on like arranging the financing that would be applicable for the deals. Uh, cause a lot of times how the deal is structured will significantly impact the ability or lack thereof to get the financing that they were planning on. Right. Um, so that, so definitely the, the mortgage broker or the bank rep need to be involved in the conversation, I think. And typically, if they hadn't already talked to their accountant, like their tax accountant about, about this before they come to me, then definitely we want to talk to the tax accountant as well, um, because uh, they're going to obviously have a lot to say as far as whether or not this is going to be a very efficient and appropriate structure to, to be uh, best suited to the, the tax goals of, of the clients. So... Basically, lawyer, client, uh, mortgage rep or bank rep, uh, and tax accountant all would kind of need to have a discussion to really determine which of these approaches is, is likely the best, the best route, at least for the foreseeable future or for the one-off projects, right? Makes sense. And so would you be able to give maybe two completely different examples that the viewers can kind of understand you know, to show why they would need these people to make these kind of decisions from your experience? Um, sorry, can you say that again, Diana? What, what uh, you, so I was saying if you have, grand. yeah, like if you have two examples of, of um, maybe clients, I mean, no saying any names or anything, but just generic mm. information on, you know, why they chose and how you saw it happening in their decisions to kind of maybe help the, the person just see how things can really drastically change uh, when sure. making a deal. Sure, sure. I mean, I, I mean, again, keep in mind, 
honestly, any one of these three possible structures and arrangements could apply in, in any situation. Uh, it like, like I said, it really just is that independent and that individualistic uh, as far as like the clients and their particular, um, you know, business partners and, and so forth. So it, it could change literally, um, you know, one client might have all three of these structures. It really depends on who their, who their business arrangement is with and the actual property itself. So it can be very, very uh, ranging, but a lot of the times, like the JV agreement seems to be a great fit for people that are dealing with a smaller number of um, investor um, investors. So, you know, if um, you, Diana, are the, you know, active party in, 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 the, in the transaction and you're looking for some investors to come on passively to help you fund and so forth. And typically, not only are you going to have a smaller number of like investors, like you have, might have one, two, one or two like investors in the JV with you. Um, it's typically a bit of a smaller property as well. It doesn't have to be small, so but it, it's typically a lower number of investors and probably a smaller kind of property, like a single family or you know maybe five five units or less is what you might typically see JVs used for. Um, that's probably, I would say, again, a broad paintbrush um, approach, right? Uh, but again, you could have a JV done for like a 50 unit place too, right? It just really depends on the mechanics of the deal. Um, so I don't want people thinking, oh, you just do JVs for small ones. Um, not, that's not, that's not true. Um, but more often than not, that's where we see JVs, smaller property types, so five units or less, and smaller numbers of investors with the active party, right? Um, corporately, the corporate one's really an interesting blend between kind of like both. I mean, as you can probably imagine, the cat's out of the bag. The GPLPs are typically, you're not going to do a GPLP for a, a duplex, like Probably not, right? Um, GPLPs are for large numbers of investors needed, like the um, uh, passive money investors, um, and typically like larger units per deal, right? That's again, broad paintbrush. That's typically where you'd see a GPLP used most predominantly, is in like probably 10 plus units to you know, to give it a number um, and like probably over, you know, five to 10 in investors as well, at least, right? Um, and, and so that's kind of like where you can kind of see them on both ends. Um, and the, But the corporate one's interesting because you could, it really could be any range, right? Um, you could have you could do a corporate structure and arrangement for just a single family or a duplex, or you could do a corporate structure for a big fifty plus unit um, acquisition or land development as well. Um, in all of these scenarios, like I said before, it's it, it's just really important to have those conversations with your whoever is going to coordinate your financing and your accountant because they really need to understand the big picture of like what, what you're trying to do and what everybody's goals are so that they can try to align the most appropriate structure um, to, to match up with the deal. Because for us as lawyers, we can do any of them. There's no right or wrong uh, arrangement, right? I think the tax and the financing are gonna have a much more significant impact on which of these that you choose. Um, because you might have a particular type of financing that you're hoping to receive, you know, from, from a bank or private lender and so forth. And then they end up, you know, saying, well, we're not going to do it if you, if you don't do this particular business arrangement or, or we're not funding a GPLP, like we're not touching that type of thing. Right. So, um, you know, th that can really dictate which model you do, right? Because you can't do this deal without money. And so if uh, if at the end of the day, 
your your parties who are arranging your financing are telling you um, we're not going to be able to get uh, the financing you want using this structure or this structure. Well, you're then I guess you your decision is made, right? We have to do the best with with that, or we need to find new financing. So. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, thank you for the examples because like that sometimes I feel like when they hear it, it makes it easier to gauge. And like you said, it, everything is so flexible. <laughs> we can all it really like you said, you really do need your team to help you out to make sure that you're making the right decisions for the mm -hmm. that you're doing. And I just want to quickly let everyone know that um, I mean, everyone on Zoom, you can just put up your hand or, or just interrupt us and ask the question. Same thing on the Facebook group. If you guys have questions, I'm monitoring the comments. So feel free to also ask questions there too. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to put that out there. So feel free to interrupt us or even in Zoom, if you want to add the comment in just to remind us in case we're in the middle of something, that's that's also good too. So um, maybe I also wanted to get more into because uh, like you said, like now the GPLP structures is like, I feel like a lot more people are starting to talk about it. So maybe we could deep dive a little bit more on on how it works, what it is, like what what makes it so different. Yeah, yeah, no, that's no problem at all. Um, so the, yeah, the, the GPLP structure um, number one is, is going to be your most expensive, um, option, um, because you've got so many components to it. So it is the most complicated of the three, and it will be the most expensive of the three, at least from our point of view as lawyers. I think you'd probably find that to be true with the accountants as well, because, um, I'll give you a high level example of what's involved in a GPLP, right? So, well, maybe I'll give you the, the other ones first. So a JV has one agreement, has a joint venture agreement. The parties can choose to be parties to the joint venture agreement uh, personally or through a corporation, right? So unless they also need assistance incorporating the corporation, um, it's, it's, one do, it's one thing right? It's this joint venture agreement. And the joint venture is just that it's only an agreement. It's just a contractual obligation to each other. It's not even a partnership, right? So uh, from the legal sense of a partnership, it's not governed by the Partnerships Act. And so it doesn't create those additional obligations to the parties. So it's literally a contract called a joint venture. So that's the simplest and it's going to be the least costly thing from the accounting standpoint and likely the, um, sorry, from the legal as well as the accounting likely. Um, the corporate structure, well, will need a corporation unless you already have one and it will need a shareholders agreement because you'll have multiple owners of a property. So you've got now kind of two things that you need the lawyer to do. And um, because a corporation, unlike a joint venture, is under the law its own legal entity as well as through tax, now you have an ongoing requirement for annual like returns and everything through the accountants. So you're going to have a maintenance cost as well as startup costs. So now we're starting to get more documentation needed as well as increased costs, right? Now let's look at the GPLP structure. So the GPLP structure typically is going to have uh, a partnership agreement which needs to be created, which is the master document for the GPLP. Like that's what will govern the relationship between the general partner and the limited partners. And the limited partners are your like capital investors coming in, right? So you've got a partnership agreement. You've got typically a corporation to create if you don't already have one for the general partner, which is going to be your, like you as the um, active party here are going to have to create a corporation to be the general partner. 
typically the accountant will normally recommend creating a second corp so you could also invest in your LP as well. So you'd invest as a limited partner as well. So now you got two corps and a partnership. And you typically might even have a family trust involved too. So if you don't have one of those already existing, usually if you're at this level of doing a GPLP and you want to do more of them, the accountant's going to say, okay, you know, we should probably be tying in family trusts into this equation now too. So you've got a family trust, you've got a couple corporations, you've got a partnership agreement. And then typically in, in these structures, you'd have a third corporation at a minimum set up that is going to acquire the actual property, but be owned by the partnership. So that's probably a lot to try to visualize without a, like an aid uh, uh, on, on the screen. But the bottom line is, I think the picture is clear to people that, oh, there's a lot more um, set up uh, cost with the lawyer and the accountant to do a GPLP. And it can be quite, um, quite varying depending on the instructions of the accountant as well, right? And, and how complex the GPLP um, situation is. But the bottom line is you're talking about several corporations, probably three or four, a partnership agreement and potentially a family trust. Um, and, and that's just kind of, you know, the, the bare bones of it, right? Um, on the flip side, this isn't stuff that we do, but on the flip side, you as an investor also need to make sure that you understand and or have somebody giving you proper advice, both from a tax and legal point of view about... Um, these, if this is in Ontario, the security laws of Ontario, you need to make sure because you're now selling um, essentially like an investment, you need to make sure that you have the exemptions. Otherwise, you have to be compliant with securities laws, which means you have to be compliant with like the OSC and Securities Act and Securities Exchange Commission. And you don't want to have to do that. So there are exemptions. Um, to qualify for it. One term that people probably, if they've looked into this already or been reading about it, they've probably heard the phrase um, an accredited investor exemption. So that's like a common uh, defined term at law that can give you an exception to security, securities regulations being needed here. But again, it further illustrates the additional complexities of a GPLP. So if you go, if you were considering going down that road, uh, road or um, you wanted to like, you know, get involved in it more and do your due diligence and just learn more about it, it's really important to realize it's, it's gonna be like quite a bit more expensive to set up properly with the lawyers and accountants as well as you need to make sure you've covered off all your basis um, to be compliant and have exemptions to securities laws of Ontario. And presumably if this is outside of Ontario and other provinces, you know, whatever that province's corresponding securities laws are. So this is more for the type of real estate investor that's very serious about it. And it's not, maybe I'll do it one time. Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. You're, you're, because, you know, the cost of doing like, you know, the corporate model, you know, maybe, you know, for the, on the lawyer side might be a couple thousand dollars extra plus, you know, any disbursements in HST because you've got an incorporation and a shareholder agreement, right? Um, the JV might be, you know, like a thousand to two thousand plus, you know, HST, right? In, in legals. But, you know, the cost of just setting up um, the GPLP structure, and this would only be after you've had a bill from your accountant, because they're probably going to need to give you like a whole opinion letter of this, uh, which is probably cost a couple thousand at least, you know, is it, 
I mean, you're probably talking between five and 10 minimum to, to get it all set up because you've got multiple corporations, uh, potentially multiple shareholder agreements, partnership agreements, maybe a family trust. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of invested you know, effort into the GPLP, but um, it's certainly only going to be suggested by the accountant or should only be suggested by the accountant and lawyer if there's going to be a significant benefit that, you know, outweighs these costs of lawyer and accounting. Like you should be able to save, you know, uh, more than you're spending, basically. Otherwise, what was the point? Right. Exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, at the end of the day, too, the GPLP structure can allow you to more. One reason I think a lot of investors that are 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 established, you know, they're they're having a fairly significant, um, um, you know, investor portfolio, property portfolio, and so forth. Uh, I think one of the reasons it's becoming quite attractive is you can have essentially like a partnership fund happening um, kind of continuously. So it means you don't have to worry for the projects to come along like one off to then try to find people to, you know, get involved with. You can, as long as you're being compliant in all ways, like I've already discussed, you could have essentially a um, GPLP fund happening in such a way that it's sort of continuous you know like if you were the if you were the general partner to the fund you would properly market to anybody anybody out there in the public um, who would qualify under the exemptions and so forth that you know this is what these this is the type of strategy this fund is is set up for this is what this fund is going to be trying to acquire like um it's even it's great if you've got actual closed prop like projects because then you can show them you know we use this lp fund or a similar lp fund to close on this and this and this and so they can see oh this is the type of property or land development that um my money's going to be going towards right but you can leave it more discretionary to say like it's going to be a it's going to be a residential apartment complex that will be bird and and held long term here's the strategy for it and it's either going to be between 20 and 50 units and here's a, here's three examples of ones that we've already done and then you know so you you can use the the GPLP structure to more continuously um, collect investor funds because you don't have to worry about um, waiting like property to property. So like part of your business is going to find the properties, the other part is doing capital raise and you don't have to worry about having one done first before you do the other. Uh, we have a question from the comments and they're asking what is the difference between the partnership agreement and the shareholders agreement? So the, the, the difference basically is shareholder agreements specifically relate only to incorporated companies and essentially like the partnership agreement and a shareholder agreement, they're going to talk very similarly, um, uh, like they're going to have very similar terms, but a shareholder agreement can only be for a corporation and the owners of the corporation because owners of a corporation have shares. So that's why they call it a shareholder agreement. And then a partnership agreement um, can has to be called the partnership agreement because you don't have shares. You just are partners of a partnership. So essentially, they're a partnership agreement and a shareholder agreement are very similar in, in context and substance. They're basically the rules and, and um, terms of how business owners are going to govern themselves. One just relates to a partnership and one relates to a incorporated business. So is that um, the partnership is how the corporations are all working together? Is that, that the partnership agreement would talk yeah, about? Yeah, so, so the GPLP structure 
the part like the ge the general partnership like the partnership agreement is is the agreement that binds all of the general partners and limited partners together so the general partner is going to be if you can think of it from a context of a jv the general partner is the active partner they're the ones you know arranging the trades doing the stuff with the bank um working with the realtors and so forth right all the all the passive partners doing in a jv which is the limited partners in the gplp structure is they're just giving money right mm -hmm. they're basically giving money and and that's it oh so it specifically only talks about them so it doesn't talk about how the corporations are structured uh, like how they're set up or anything it's just specifically um, on the two partners so in the GPLP limited, like in the partnership agreement that ties the GPLP together, there, there's going to be discussion of, of how the whole partnership works. So how does the relationship between the GP, um, like the general partner and the LP, the limited partners, which are the investors, like how, how does that relationship work? What, what can the GP do? Um, what's what rights do they have in managing, supervising, and controlling the partnership? And then, you know, what sort of rights do the limited partners have in in the partnership? And you know, what obligations do they have? What liability do they have? And so forth. Most of the time, not all of the time, but most of the time, in the GPLP structure, usually the limited partner, as the name suggests, they're limited only to their um, uh investment in into the partnership like that's their mo that's the most they could lose the general partner has infinite liability though. okay and uh and they have a question specifically for the partnership i think and expand it more because i think it's probably good to know but uh because they're talking about the partnership agreement um like what terms but I'm just curious if we just go through all three when it comes to like the JV, the shareholders agreement and the partnership agreement, what are terms that you think that people should focus on or ask themselves to make sure are in each of those different types of agreements? Well, I mean, obviously you're gonna wanna know who all the parties are. So you'll wanna have all the parties clearly denoted. Um, you're gonna have like a term you know, like, what's the term? If there is a term, is it finite? Is it, does it, you know, end on a certain date? Um, you're going to have a whole bunch of terms about, you know, everybody's um, roles and responsibilities. What, what sort of um, controlling interest do people have or not have? Like the GP is the one who's going to have all the ability to control the partnership, whereas the, all the investors don't have, usually have any of those rights um it's going to talk about like how does the investment component work for the partnership you know investing money and so forth what what happens if there's additional capital required you know uh what what are the obligations on the investors at that point um so there's going to be a whole bunch of sections that talk about that kind of thing um there's going to be sections that talk about you know what if there's problems right you know what if at the end of the day uh, an investor needs to get out, right? They need to get out before the end of the term. Like how do those exit strategies work? What are the exit opportunities and rights and parameters that need to exist, right? Um, so, and this is kind of as it relates to the, the GPLP. I mean, you could apply this to the other scenarios as well. Like what would go into a JV? What would go into a shareholders agreement? I mean, Th those are those are kind of your general topic areas that you need provisions on but um uh, you know you you'd you'd want to more specifically talk to a lawyer about you know the details it's it's hard to just say here's your list and you're good right um because like i said every situation is a bit unique and a bit complicated um but yeah you've got parties you've got terms You've got capital contributions. You've got additional capital contributions. You've got um, just who's who's got what role and has what rights of decision making or lack thereof. And you've got like exit 
exit strategies, you know, and, and dispute resolution and so forth, right? So um, those are the, those are at a high level, different sections and categories that you can have multiple, you know, sub subsections and so forth on. But th those are the, those are the things you're gonna wanna have. I mean, the most important part I would say I mean, it's all important, but I mean, the most important part is being very clear with one another and being comfortable with um, like how you get out of it, right? Because most of the time, everybody, it, nobody cares about like getting into it because you got into it because you, you're excited about it and you trust everybody and so forth, right? Where it matters is how do you get out of it because you probably don't like each other at that point. Right. So you need to have a very clear understanding of like what risk are you getting into in that kind of scenario? And do you clearly understand the steps and components required to exit out of this thing? And are they acceptable to you? Yeah. And just like you were saying, right, it's when things are good, it's easier to have those conversations on how to exit or negotiation, whatever it is, if they're decision making uh, that needs to be put in the writing. It's easier to do it when things are good yeah. than when things are bad. Because if you're trying to negotiate when everyone's pissed, <laughs> yeah, that just makes no. life more complicated. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and so obviously with the GPLP, you can't even really do it like after the fact. It, it, it has to be set up structurally ahead of time. Like you can't, you know, lots of people out there, if you've been doing investment for a while, lots of people will have done like, you know, sign their JVs, maybe post the deal closing, or maybe the shareholder agreement gets like completed, you know, post the corporation and the acquisition of the real estate. I mean, as a lawyer, I don't recommend that, but I understand that it practically sometimes it happens, right? People don't realize they need to do it or, or people just, it's, there's so many things happening so quickly um, you, you prioritize and, you know, the closing of the deal kind of is trumping, you know, putting these, these terms together in an agreement, right? But in a perfect world, the JV, the DPLP documents, um, a shareholder agreement for a corporation structure, I mean, all of those in a perfect world, you have done and signed on the day of closing or before, right? In, in a perfect world, that's what you want to have happen because uh, as you just said, you don't want to be trying to talk about those things afterwards when maybe things are starting to get mucky or in your discussions of those terms, they become mucky because people are now like, oh, wait a second, that's not what we talked about. You didn't say it was going to be this, this, and this, right? So, you know, ideally the lawyer point here is you need to get these things all done ahead of time. But I, I practically understand as an investor that sometimes they happen post-closing, but you definitely cannot do the GPLP post-closing. Like you can't, you just can't even do it. You won't have a proper GPLP without all the things being done ahead of time. Yeah. That one is actual planning required. <laughs> yeah. 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 There's way too much exposure and risk. Well, structurally, you just can't even do it. It just can't even happen without everything being put together by the lawyers and accountants first, and then you start doing your stuff, right? Um, the JV agreement, um, the incorporation structure, you know, it's possible to close a deal without the signed JV. Again, not advisable, but po completely possible. Um, and again, completely possible to close the corporate deal with the incorporation created, but no shareholder agreement signed yet. Again, not advisable, but completely possible to do. Dwayne, did you have a question that you wanted to ask? Um, actually, I, I, I think they're mostly covered, but, um, and then if you've already got a couple of corporations in play um, and you wanna start taking on some bigger investments, uh, do you have like a, I guess, framework for a GPLP, but something that's really clean and simple? Do you have like a framework for that? Something that, because um, the internet is a dangerous place, right? Um, mm -hmm. That 
a lot of the information on there is kind of correct adjacent. Some of the information is good, but kind of right. So. Yeah, yeah. It's all about a application and applicability. Like, you know, sometimes you're reading something that might be, you know, from a different, like it could be right, but, you know, for Alberta, you know, as yeah. opposed yeah. to yeah. Ontario, right? Yeah. Uh, or it could be, yeah, this is totally right if you have the exact same, you know, facts and scenarios, but, you know, you've got that, that fact and scenario with like a caveat B, right? So yeah. now B, B makes quite a bit of a difference, right? So um, yeah, no, totally agree with you. Um, the, honestly, with the GPLP, it's very difficult to like, to just give, I know like investors love to just kind of have sort of like, here you go, here's the cheat sheet, go for it, right? Um, yeah. You just can't really do it with the GPLP. It's just, um, there's too many moving parts. It's, it's just far too unique. And I mean, I can't even like really do anything until I, like I said, I know that we've had the conversation and the instructions from your like financing arm, your, your bank rep or your mortgage broker, and then your tax arm, which is like your accountant, because um, like really everything has to come from them first, because we don't even want to take you down that path of doing all that legal work if all of a sudden somebody says, oh, your financing won't work, right? Or this, this, this is going to have this tax implication and then you're, that's no good for you, right? So um, yeah, the GPLP is, I mean, some GPLPs have family trust and then some don't, right? So th there's a variance right there already, right? Um, some GPLPs will have the same like group that is the general partner they'll also have their, they'll, they'll have a corporation for that and they'll have a corporation to be a limited partner, like an investor, right? But then some don't because some will, sometimes some GPs don't actually uh, invest as limited partners as well, right? So there's a lot, there's quite a few little nuances and so forth. Um, and like I said, most of the GPLP structures that I've seen typically have the, the limited partners, the investors limited in their exposure to the investment. So if, if the if the ask was for everybody to give $50,000 um, as a minimum investment into the uh, partnership, yep. and you're trying to get, um, you know, up to $5 million into the fund for some development project or some apartment complex, because the financing kind of covered the difference, um usually the limited partners are only going to be on the hook to lose their 50 like if the stuff all went you know down the toilet right um but i just saw one which was a very large lp like it was close to half a billion dollars um this was like, this is with a very large corporation, right? A very large pre-existing uh, con um, construction corp. Yep. Um, they were offering essentially the opportunity to their higher level executives and stuff, the opportunity through this fund to be a part of this large land development, right? It's like seven condo towers, the smallest of which is like 35 stories, right? So it's, is big, right? So that's why yeah. it's such a big number, um, you know, you know, half a billion, right? So, uh, and there, they were just being asked to put in a hundred thousand, right? But in that particular example, the limited partner wasn't going to be limited just to a hundred thousand. They could potentially have greater exposure and I don't, I don't want to get into like the details of it because it would just be more complicated than I think we need here. But there, there could be an example where a limited partner could get more exposure than just their investment. But like I said, this is a much bigger and potentially more complicated LP than I think what most people listening to this um, are going to be like putting together or involved with. I don't think many of us are doing like, you know, hundreds of millions of dollar 
um, projects, right? Most yeah, I, are, I, I personally, I'm only, I, I'm more concerned and, and scratch my own itch, more of a kind of day one sort of thing, right? So which comes first, the project or the GPLP so that you can raise capital? To feed yeah. a product, to feed a yeah. the future project, right? Yeah, and and that's where I think so. The answer would be the GPLP um, typically comes comes first um, because you can you can create the GPLP as essentially um, like a blind fund or like a, a an ongoing fund, where in your prospectus to your your possible investors out there. You're basically providing them with a disclosure document that says, you know, these are examples of the projects that we're going to be using your your money in this fund to go acquire, to go, you know, burr or whatever the case is, right? Like it's commonly these are you're you're going after. Um, a, you know, either land, some sort of land development. Or you're going after like you know multi um, uh, multi residential like apartment buildings, right? Um, yeah. You know, 20, 30, 40 plus units, and you're you're probably trying to acquire ones that are let's call them distressed. You know, they're they're significantly out of date, and you know, yes, you're going to have to input capital and resources to renovate them and refurbish them. But through all of that happening, you've not only recaptured your investment uh, in the new value, but you've probably like double or tripled it, right? So now you go to the bank and instead of having like private or B lending financing, now you're getting a like commercial RBC loan or something, right? Yeah. And then it wipes out the private and then a portion of what the, the investors invested in, they're gonna get paid, they're gonna get that paid back, right? And then if they're staying in the partnership, they're going to continue to get um, their percentage of like return on just the annual cash flowing. Now that's happening and everything. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, it's um, so I mean, I have seen it done both ways, like where sometimes people went and got the project first and then they put the fund together. It just takes a lot of work to put it all together. Right. Like it takes probably at least, well, depends. Right. Like, I mean, everybody's a bit different with their lawyers and their accountants and themselves. Right. Like some of I'm thinking of some of our clients because they're fairly comfortable and astute with a lot of this paperwork, like some of it they do themselves. Right. Like some of the work they end up doing themselves because they've done this now many times right like they're on like their 10th fund right yeah. for example um but i would and then there's some that you know maybe like yourself you're trying to decide to do for the first time right yeah. um you know so if you're not that person who's really kind of comfortable and astute because you've you've done this many times now or or you just have a partner that has done it many times um you know, you probably need the accountant and the lawyer to do more uh, of it, uh, at least the first couple of times, you know, around until you kind of feel like, okay, some of these things I can do in house. Um, you know, these other ones I can't for sure. And I'll need to keep using the accountant and lawyer to do that. But some of it I'll need to, some of it I can take in house to kind of streamline your a your product your uh, productiveness and b probably save on some some cost right because you're just you're doing it internally um and that's going to be stuff like uh you know the, the the term sheet you know subscription of units um potentially even the partnership agreement itself right like you might be able to do a bunch of that stuff internally as you're more and more familiar with it you become more and more comfortable but and and as long as you, like you have a bit of a let's call it a repeating formula with your finance and your accounting advice right 
but for the first one or even maybe the first few until you've got a bit of repetition and comfort level building like we're you're probably using accountants and lawyers pretty heavily to do a lot of the documents um which again depending on the team you're working with and how busy they are it's going to be at least a 30-day like ramp of time probably to be honest with you closer to 60. okay right uh, like we take like 30 to 60 days just to put it together yeah probably yeah. you know okay. i would say on average I, I whereas like a jv you know instead of it being one to two months it might be like one or two weeks right okay. Um, and incorporation, same thing might just be like, you know, one week to get the thing incorporated and then like maybe two or three weeks to do the shareholder agreement. Right. So, you know, the G, the GPLP has its benefits, but it's, there's, there's a lot of, there, there's a lot of extra cost, and, um, there's a lot of additional complexity. And so you really just have to really ask yourself, is it the, is it the thing that makes the most sense for me? And do I really, do I really want to get this complicated? Because you, you, you know, you, you can buy, um, like if you're thinking about scaling to like, you know, some land development or, you know, some larger, you know, 10 plus unit properties, you can still do those with a JV and you can still do those with, uh, um, you know, corporate structure. I mean, I think the real, real benefit of the GPLP is the ability to just constantly, especially if you do it as a more like discretionary fund where you're not simply saying, this is the only, pro like, here's the project. And this fund is only for, only for that. You know, like if you're making a bit broader to say in the term sheet and your sort of your solicitation for investors, if you're basically um, saying that it will it will do projects like A, B, C, and D, and here's examples of them, and this is the scope of of how this fund and the money will be used. Like we won't go outside of the scope, and this is our yard, and here's our boundary lines and everything like that. But um, the real benefit is you can just if you do that. Uh, fund that type of partnership GPLP, then you can just consistently keep raising capital. You don't have to worry about oh, you know, did I find the project yet? Which yeah. is a, which is a bit different than the JVs and the corporate structure. You're typically, waiting you you go shopping first to get the project, and then you're like, okay, now do I have anybody that I can like tag like tag in with this right? And so. Yeah. It's a more definitive A and then B, whereas I think a lot of people on these bigger projects love the GPLP component because you could continuously fund have money funding in, so you know you've got this money, right? But I think you've got to be comfortable at that point too, because people have now invested into your into your fund, yeah. um, like they're expecting it's going to do something, right? So it puts a bit of pressure on you as well as the general partner to be like do i actually have projects like ready sitting ready to go because if it takes you six to 12 months to get a project or, or now you haven't deployed that money for six to 12 months they're going to be like well, you know what what gives right like i was expecting some immediate kind of action so that they're hopefully getting their some return on their investment right? some return on their investment yeah i just um I, I do know a lot of people are raising capital, like through prom notes and that sort of thing. Mm. Um, and from a mortgage broker standpoint, prom notes are just. A... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like not, it... yeah. Not to mention, like, if you're the, pro, like, if you're giving, like, if you're, if you're involved as a real estate investor, and you're giving the prom note, but it's unsecured, like in the sense that it's not a it's not collaterally registered as a mortgage on the property. Um, that's a much higher risk, right? Because now you just have you still have the the prom note as a document that you could you know enforce on if they're not paying the paying you back. But the problem is, it you know that that's only as good as you can take take them to court on or something like that, right? Whereas yeah. at least 
that it's secured with a um, registration against the property as a charge or something like that, then at least you have an option if there's equity in the property for like uh, like power of sale or something, right? So, yeah, I've, I I personally don't really like. I, I would it would definitely have to be somebody that I really knew and really yeah. trusted. Right. To, Which is what yeah, it should yeah. be, I think, when you're doing something like that. Yeah, but I, yeah. but I do know there's quite a few guys that are that are at, like they're doing stuff on prom notes and looking for unsecured mm -hmm. money, um, and it's just kind of a it 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 turns into a never-ending cycle, right? Yeah. So I, yeah. But, uh, I, I wanted to. Oh, sorry. You finish it. Finish what you're gonna say, Ryan. Uh, oh no, no, that's good. Yeah, no, I'm good. Yeah, no, I was just going to say uh, thank you so much, Ryan, for coming on because I know how busy you are. I know this week is a killer week for you. No um, but if if you wanted to share any information with the viewers, if they want to get in contact with you. Yeah, I mean, all of our contact details for myself and, and the other lawyers in the firm are at uh, carsonlaw.ca. And um, all my contact de details there, best way to reach me is email which is ryan at carsonlaw.ca. Uh, but like the office number and even my cell number is available on the website. But um, emailing me is, the, is definitely the best way to reach me. And, um, you know, we're, we'd be happy to talk with everybody more specifically about what they're doing and what we might be able to help with and, and uh, build a relationship. So we're looking forward to uh, chatting with anybody uh, that reaches out. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ryan. The information you gave was so <laughs> informational. I think everyone got a lot of value from it. Thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome, Diana. Uh, nice to talk with you, Dwayne. And, um, nice talking with and, you. Thanks, Ryan. And, and April, thanks for posting some notes in the chat. Thanks. Awesome. We'll see everyone in the next episode. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.